Right. Good good morning, everyone, and um, welcome to the second meeting of the OERU MVP Task Force. And a special uh, welcome to uh, our colleague from the UK. It's, it's very late in the evening. And uh, Andy, I really appreciate the fact that you're uh, staying up uh, to this hour to, to join the meeting. We, we really do appreciate uh, really do appreciate it. So a big welcome from my desk. Uh, and I, I will get start. Uh, let's let's get started um, with the agenda. I've posted the agenda in the wiki as we always do with our open meetings. Uh, just by way of orientation for folk who are joining the MVP task force meetings for the first time, uh, just a quick recap on our terms of reference, which we approved at the last meeting. Um, the key function or the or the, the purpose of this group is to work on the implementation of the OERU first year of study. Uh, we are currently busy with phase one, which is to complete a minimum of 10 uh, exemplar courses that will be completed and available for delivery by September. That is just before our next partners meeting, uh, which will be hosted from the 3rd to 5th of October at the University of Highlands and Islands in Inverness. Uh, it, these courses will be hosted on the co uh, common platform using our WordPress publishing model for you know, courses that are authored in the wiki. Uh, these courses will be accessible from one site at oeru.org. And we are targeting um, two exit credentials. So just in terms of the terms of reference, that's what this group is about. Uh, the members of this group is anyone that is really working on uh, one of the MVP courses, either as learning designer or academic subject matter expert, as well as uh, in any of the stakeholders that have an interest in what we're doing, uh, including the members of the OER Foundation Board. So without further ado, let, let's just uh, move over to introduction and welcomes, and I'll introduce you in the order I have you on my screen. So, uh, Gail, let me hand over to you from Kamloops. Just okay, so I just had to unmute my mic. Yeah, I just got back to work from um, presenting at a conference, CNIE, in Waterloo. So I'm feeling a little jet lagged and it's hot. It's about 30, 35 degrees in Kamloops. But happy to be here. Hi to everyone. Thanks, Gail. Uh, moving on then, uh, Andy, if I can hand over to you. Andy hasn't got her video running due to uh, bandwidth. Uh, well, she, uh, Andy's busy conserving bandwidth. So, Andy, if you just remember to unmute your mic and uh, let me hand over to you. Welcome. Thanks, Rain. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm up in the north of Scotland, and even though I'm on the main at mainland, our bandwidth is appalling, so you won't be seeing any video from me during this meeting. Um, it's also 11 o'clock at night here, so um, I hope that uh, my contributions will be okay. <laughs> Oh, Andy, I'm sure they'll be fine. And, and again, I, I would like to acknowledge, you know, you staying up so late for this meeting. It, it, it really helps us tremendously not having to schedule two meetings and it's much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, moving on then, next on the screen uh, from the Christchurch office of the OER Foundation, Dave. Yes, hello, Dave Lane from uh, Christchurch, in, just north of where Wayne is in the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, it's actually winter here, but um, yeah, a bit warmer than where Wayne is. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, excited about uh, hearing what all the contributions are that you all have to make to our MVP. And uh, I'm keen to be the one who helps to package them all up and make them deliverable to our potential learners and uh, to help you all with your collaborations as well. There we go. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and back to Canada now, Randy. You remember to unmute yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, um, I'm Randy, and I'm working on the Principles of Marketing course, and uh, I'm happy that there's a second meeting because uh, it uh, gives some structure to the uh, work we're doing. So, Yeah, and uh, the progress is, is quite impressive, I have to say. Uh, moving on then, uh, down to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, 
uh, David Bull, that is, yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, good to be at another MVP uh, meeting. Um, I'm from University of Southern Queensland, and uh, I'll be able to report a little bit about how we're progressing with the regional relations in Asia and the Pacific uh, course. Thanks, thanks, David, and, and welcome again. And back to the Northern Hemisphere, uh, through to Edmonton, Rory. Rory, remember to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, Rory. Well, that's good. Let me... Uh... <clears throat> we're, uh, we're working uh, on uh, two, two modules, two courses, uh, ec um, economics, microeconomics, and uh, macroeconomics. And uh, my understanding is they'll both, uh, uh, microeconomics is pretty well ready and uh, the macro will be finished by the end of this month. Oh, wow. That, that's good news, uh, Rory. Uh, yeah, we'll, it will definitely be finished. Uh, uh, I don't know what work he, um, Dan has to do with you, uh, Wayne. Okay. So, and uh, these will be clap. Uh, uh, courses, so they'll be eligible for a CLEP exam uh, in the United States and Athabasca and other universities recognize CLEP credits. Oh, yeah, um, we do have uh, a number of courses that will be available for CLEP exams. That's, that's great. Rory, you'll see that I don't have those two courses listed because they weren't listed in the wiki yet under the implementation plan, but I'll get that updated. I um, also just want to acknowledge uh, Rory is also a member of the board of directors of the OER Foundation and you know it's great to have this level of interest from the board as well. So um, we're moving on then, uh, Christine in Canada, yeah. Yeah, Montreal. Um, I don't know, I don't know what to say. I um, think it's great to uh, meet you all again and um, we, Cameron and I have been working on the the principles management course and uh, it's uh, almost finished and it's very exciting to uh, see it come together and uh, yeah we're very excited to to see all this uh, happening. Fantastic welcome Christine and uh, let's go directly to Cameron. Across the room and still in Montreal. Hello everyone. Um, as Christine said we're working on principles of management. Um, uh, yeah it's coming along really well. Um, we uh, had a good push this late week, and I think we'll be uh, we'll probably have all our content in by the end of the week, and then we're going to spend the rest of the month making it purdy and making sure it makes sense um, instead of cross-checking stuff because there's a little bit of overlap between modules. But yeah, it's coming along nicely. Um, we are not quite at 35 degrees that we are in summer. Our Montreal weather has crashed nicely, and I think we're about to get 14 and possibly crappy rain tomorrow. So, anyways, good evening, or morning. Yeah, hi. Hi, Cameron, yeah. Uh, it's, a little, it's a wee bit colder here in Moscow this morning. We had minus six, but I know by Canadian standards, that's quite balmy. Harden up. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, moving on then, uh, Adrian, you, you're next on my list. Back to the Southern Hemisphere. Yep, thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, my name is Adrian Stagg. I'm with the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba. I don't have any um, video on at the moment because I'm actually joining you from home before I head onto campus. And uh, the internet connection that I have at home is pretty poor. Um, I'm assisting with the regional relations courses and I'm also the one who brought up the, uh, the discussion around the, the quality assurance of uh, OERU courses. Thanks, Adrian, Thank and it's, it's great to have you on board as well. Welcome. Uh, moving on then, Thank uh, you, uh, Mark, back to the US, uh, Trenton, New Jersey, I believe. Oh, oh, yes, although actually today I'm in Philadelphia. I uh, directed a conference on the uh, learning assessment and that sort of thing. So we're in the middle of that right now, but uh, uh, I We've been working on uh, developing um, support materials for several of the courses you all have mentioned, and uh, as well as uh, to get, review some of these courses for alignment with uh, uh, other assessments that, that will lead to uh, credit here. So, 
a little bit, a lot of things going on. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, we may have a bit of uh, latency. Your, your audio was breaking up a bit for me, but uh, it's great that you could, uh, could be here. And when, if it proves to be a bit of a challenge around connectivity, um, you, you can say less. <laughs> You're welcome. That's right. Uh, no worries. Um, and back to Canada, um, David Porter. Hi, everyone. Just sitting in as a member of the OERE board and happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. And uh, again, we appreciate the time that the board members are putting into, you know, uh, give, you know giving guidance and input into this process. And uh, the, uh, last but not least, um, Ari from the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, good morning. I just, uh, uh, in fact, I did have a technical problem, but just five seconds ago, and I was able to uh, get this working. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, working with that uh, USQ uh, Open Education Resource course with uh, uh, Marcus Harm. So um, basically, I don't have so much more than that to say about currently. Fantastic. Thanks, Ari. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to attempt a desktop screen, uh, desktop share, and if we are if we're lucky, it should be coming through for you. And my desktop is not hanging; uh, it should be coming through for you. So just very basically, in terms of the MVP uh, implementation plan, uh, the minimum viable product, we are working on. the implementation of the, the courses that I have listed. I just wanted to uh, link and point out to the list of courses that we have. It's, uh, it's an impressive list. We are on, top on well, we, we will exceed our target of 10 courses. We currently have 17, and now with the confirmation from Athabasca University for the micro and macroeconomics, uh, that will now increase to 19 courses. So we are well on target to achieving the strategic objectives uh, we set ourselves at the last partners meeting. So that's great, great news. I just wanted to also point out there are a number of the courses that are available for CLEP credit and to the best of my knowledge and understanding, CLEP credit will be recognized by all our North American partners. So that's also a good, uh, you know, a good sign. So moving on with the agenda, uh, what I'd like to do is just take a very brief report back on the progress of each of the courses uh, that are under development. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of the Creating Sustainable Futures course. I'm part of the course team. The lead uh, designer uh, on, on this course is Carol Cooper-Taylor. Uh, we are progress, we are well on target here. Uh, we've in fact completed the, or had sign off on the first um, micro course in, in, in the, uh, well, of the first micro course of the Creating Sustainable Futures course, it's been signed off by the academics. You know, it's been published, uh, so this is uh, well on track. I'm also happy to report that uh, the course will be completed by the 30th of June. So um, that's good progress. I can also confirm that Otago Polytechnic will be offering micro credentials, that is in other words, and a certificate of achievement for each of the micro courses that will also be available for a digital badge uh, for assist learning. Uh, so that's good progress we've been making on creating sustainable futures. Uh, moving on then, uh, principles of management, let me hand over to the team in Montreal. Uh, one of the three microcursors is completely finished, and the other two, I would say, are what about eighty percent, Cameron? Finished? I'm harder on myself. I was going to say seventy percent. Uh, okay, um, but uh, should be completed by you know within days, and uh, we're also uh, very confident that we'll have everything done by uh, the thirtieth of June. So um, it's going really well. Yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. That's good to hear. And uh, thanks for all the hard work uh, on your end. I've, uh, had, I've been poking around and the, the, the course is looking good. Cool. Cameron, I think you need to unmute your mic. 
There you go. I've, I actually do use computers all the time. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think Christine's tidier than I am, and, but I, and I have to go back and do some um, adding ins of graphics to my module that I'm working on. But yeah, and I'm really happy and it's coming along quite nicely. It's a humongous change from doing really corporate locked stuff like I do in my day job. So it's been a pleasure. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's great to see this progress. It's actually quite exciting, uh, you know, to see the first year of study being completed. Uh, let me hand over to, to Randy and Principles of Marketing. Randy, remember to unmute yourself. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay. So uh, I'm um, doing their principles of marketing. Uh, I would say that I'm about 40% complete across the micro courses. Uh, a challenge has been to figure out a way to organize my work so that I learn what's required for the first one. And then in a sense, propagate my learning across the micro courses. So, um, so that's been actually kind of interesting to, to um, see the pickup in speed in terms of the course development for micro course two and three. Um, there's also been uh, some challenges uh, relating to uploading files, but um, uh, you know, thanks to uh, Wayne and Jim, I think I have it, but if I don't, I know, I know that Wayne and now Dave will be there. Um, I also, I've been, um, as I go along, uh, I've been uploading pictures from the Wikimedia or Media Wiki, and um, I found that kind of a joy to use uh, because it um, gives you the code so readily and uh, is really in easy to integrate, um, you know, into the pages. So. So uh, I anticipate that I will make the June 30 deadline. Um, um, I'm back from uh, Marvie holiday in Prince Edward Island. And um, anyway, so, uh, so I'm ready to sort of, you know, um, continue the final push. Yeah. Oh, and Randy, thank, uh, thanks for reminding us of the instant commons. That's the technology that is used to link uh, images from the Wikimedia Commons to our Wiki. Uh, if you use the same file name that is on the Wikimedia Commons, it will automatically import all the metadata and embed the image uh, automatically. And it, it, it's really a big time saver. So, yeah, I strongly recommend that folk, you know, use the Wikimedia Commons. It really saves time and effort. And it's, you know, it's an example of, you know, remix and uh, reuse in a very effective way. Yeah, thanks for that, Randy. Uh, Moving on then, uh, Gail, let me hand over to you on corporate communication. I know you have a much later deadline, but... Um... Okay. Um, I have to apologize. I have two deadlines that I need to meet shortly. One is I'm writing a paper for a journal and it's due June 15th. After that's in, my time is going to be totally devoted to this project. So I'm hoping to be done everything by the end of... August. I've figured out how to break up the course. Um, so it's just for me to get going and, and put 100% effort into this project. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention at the conference I just presented at, one thing I learned from some of the presenters, there is a website, swaysway.com, swayy.com. And they said that if you just simply type in, it's, it's a site to do digital storytelling and so on. But if you simply type in a topic, it gives you in like one click, quite a lot of open Creative Commons images that are on the web, as well as Creative Commons licensed videos that are on the web. And I'm thinking, oh, you mean without searching and searching, just by typing in your topic into Sway, it will help you find all the um, open images. So hopefully that's going to be useful to me and to other people 
as we go forward. I heard the Montreal folks say, once the content is done, then they want to go back and make the course visually appealing. So hopefully that's going to be helpful. Yeah. But I'm not too worried. I know once I put my mind to this project, because I've done the um, art appreciation and techniques and I did the intro to research methods for psychology, I have a pretty good uh, grasp that it's going to go quickly once I get started. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and that's a good good point, Gail. Uh, you have uh, extensive experience in you know assembling these courses in the wiki with the art appreciation and also the research methods course. So I, I have no doubts that it, it will go very quickly. Uh, you know, once once you're onto it. And and thanks for the the reference to sway.com. I'm not familiar with the site. I'll certainly f I've made a note of it. I'll follow it up and uh, I'll I'll post some feedback on the main list about uh, you know after the meeting. So thanks for that. Uh, let me moving on then to regional relations in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, David Bull, I believe you'll be reporting back, and of course Ari and Adrian, we uh, welcome additional comments, of course. Yeah. Uh, yes, look, I, I uh, caught up with uh, Marcus Harms yesterday just to see how things were going. Marcus is uh, sort of the examiner for the course, so I know that Ari, Ari is probably uh, more closely tuned to what's been going on than I am, but, but fundamentally um, that was a conversion of the, the full course into the four micro courses and my understanding is that they are more or less completed now and functional and ready to go. Um, a little bit of tidying up still to do here and there, but in the main I think uh, we're pretty much ready to rock and roll with, with this course again, with all four micro courses. Yeah, Dave, David, I, I must say the, the restructuring into the micros is, is looking very good. And it's, you know, it's great to see sort of the USQ corporate identity and, and color schemes, you know, coming through uh, on the course. It's, it's uh, the team are doing a, a sterling job. So, Ari, I'm, I'm not sure if you wanted to um, add anything. Uh, well, I just like I want to comment that, uh, uh, well, we have to still uh, change uh, images and uh, uh, put the text in some of the pages and so forth. So that's, uh, uh, but we, uh, that's correct that we don't have a huge amount of work uh, ahead of us, what I understand. So that uh, we are almost here. Yeah. And um, so another course that will be ready for MVP the 30th of September, that's looking good. Uh, next on the list, uh, I'm going to just report back on behalf of uh, Linda Ward. Uh, we have received a few uh, a few written apologies uh, from Marcus, of course, uh, Jim Taylor, who is traveling, Linda Ward, who's at another meeting, and Fahad, I believe there's another event at DC campus today. Uh, he was unable to, to make the meeting, so I just wanted to note those apologies. Uh, the Indigenous Australia course is completed. Uh, as a single course, we are currently in the process of restructuring it uh, as, as four micros. Uh, what I'll just, by way of interest here, we can uh, just have a look here. You can see they have actually implemented a a theme which is, uh, you know, a, a, a pro more appropriate for Indigenous uh, studies. So that's progressing well. This is on track uh, and will also be ready uh, for MVP. Uh, the academics are also working on the division of the assessment for the four micro courses. So there's good progress there as well. Uh, introduction to research methods in psychology. The course is completed. Uh, it is available as a full course. Uh, the only bit of work that would need to be done there is just structuring it uh, as as micro courses. Um, I mean, again, that's not uh, that's not a lot of work. Uh, it, it can, uh, you know, on the assessment side, we can still have one assessment uh, for the course, you know, according to the regional assessment design. But in terms of MVP, we want to structure all the courses as micro courses. So that's on the list to do. Is that, is that correct, Gail? Uh, you know, uh, just need okay. to unmute. Yeah. Yes. Um, I haven't been given the project to... Uh break it into micro courses. When we were designing it, Rajiv and Fahad, we did make notes to ourselves if ever we wanted to put it as micro courses, how to break it up. But I think I need to work on that corporate communication one first and then break this one up. But, but I haven't been uh, 
tasked to do yep. either seven or eight at the moment. So my focus is on number four, corporate communication. Okay. But I know it's doable, so perhaps I should just get the new one finished and then turn my attention to breaking those into micro courses after. Okay. Well, okay, Gail, I mean, this is a conversation we can pick up with Erwin. I, I can also yeah. just have a look to see if we have a little funding at the foundation to perhaps help out with that. So okay. um, we'll, we'll take that conversation off, offline. And the same okay. for the art appreciation and techniques course that is completed. It's just about just re restructuring it in the wiki for the micros. Um, so um, we'll take that conversation offline. And as you say, it's, it's not a lot of work to get that done. We'll, yeah. buy, you know, we'll figure out how we'll, we'll get it done by the 30th of September. Okay. So uh, that's all good. Uh, I'm keeping fingers crossed that audio holds out for Mark, but uh, the critical reasoning course the, the full course is completed. It's, it's available as a Google Sites version. And I know that uh, Stephen Phillips has been working on the first iteration uh, in, in the wiki. Mark, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything to that. I'm sorry for taking away your report. I'm just, I was just a bit concerned about the audio. Huh. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I, I, I'm experiencing audio issues, listening to others occasionally. It may just be the... Uh, individual um, but no we haven't done that much with it. It, it, it is there available in a Google website we, we took that from the UNISA of course so there's there's a, an additional alternative version um, there as well one other thing that we're doing I, I should mention is that we're developing a list of uh, resources open resources that are not in the courses itself that uh, students want to use as a supplement to the course. These are the heaps of any number of other places. So we're a bit more of our. Look, Mark, I think you, you must have a, a poor net connection. Your audio was breaking up badly. Uh, but from what I did pick up, uh, I understand that you are identifying a number of supplemental resources uh, that you're looking to integrate. If there is anything else uh, that we missed in, in the feedback, you can just ping me an email and I'll just make sure that that's reported in the minutes. Okay. Uh, moving on then to introduction to psychology. I haven't had any uh, report back from the authors on this KPU course. I am aware that they have selected a textbook and, and compiled one with the, or the, uh, I, I, I forget the, the, the project's name uh, that they're using the open textbook, but they've compiled a, a, an open textbook that they're planning to use for the course. They, the subject matter experts have decided on the division of, into the uh, three micro courses, uh, but I haven't seen any development in the wiki yet, so we need to follow up on the Introduction to Psychology course. And the last one on the list here is Introduction to Business, and that is Andy. I, if Andy's still awake, it must be getting a bit, pretty late now. I am indeed still awake, but my computer's flagging. It took me about six clicks to unmute. Um, introduction to business is, um, well, what I'm doing at the moment is working through all the documentation, which I think, Wayne, you wanted um, me to talk about later on in the agenda. So I haven't really got anything to say about introduction to business at this stage. That's, that's fine, Andy. Um, Moving on then with agenda, I just quickly want to acknowledge uh, new confirmed courses that have been added to the list since we last met. I, I'm pleased to report that uh, we had our first course team meeting of the Learning in a Digital Age course, or LEADER for short. Uh, Otago Polytechnic has confirmed that they will offer credentialing services. 
and we are working with uh, partner institutions that already have similar courses at their institutions to maximize reuse potential across the network. Uh, we've also contracted uh, Grania Canol, uh, who many of you will know, uh, who is you know, one of the leading authorities in e-learning e design. Uh, and uh, their course is progressing well and it will be completed by the 30th of September. I'm also happy to report that one, uh, we've just commissioned uh, a consultant, Dr. Deborah Mayerson, uh, to assemble the world history in the modern era. Of course, I, I believe there is a TCEP assessment at Thomas uh, Edison State University, so that's, that course will also be completed by the 30th of September. Uh, I'm also pleased to report that uh, Otago Polytechnic will be developing an introduction to project management course. We have a full open course available at third year level. This course will be converted to a first year level course and will be taken to academic boards so that Otago Polytechnic will be able to accredit uh, that course. I'm also pleased to confirm that uh, the University of Southern Queensland has nominated uh, elite sport performance, psychological perspectives, but my understanding is it will take, um, it, uh, it, it, this will not necessarily be ready for by the 30th of September because there's some additional approvals that would be needed at uh, USQ, you know, to get this on the books. Um, David, is, is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Wayne, that is correct. There's a few things that have to be done yet before we can make a formal offer of that course. Okay, but that's looking good. Um, I'm also just acknowledging the uh, course submissions uh, that we're targeting at UHI. There are uh, two additional courses that have been nominated. So um, how this will work is we will get the valid, uh, we're targeting to get the validation of the CERT HE uh, by, by the end of this year. Uh, so the courses will be listed, but uh, to be off, uh, be available by, by the end of the year and Andy will be able to speak to that a, a, little, a little later. So what I might just do in the interest of time, in case you need to leave us a little earlier, Andy, is let me move on then to uh, number four on the agenda, which is the, the approval of the CERT HE framework. And um, you can update us on uh, the, the progress and what's happening behind the scenes there. Thanks, Wayne. Um, we have um, a variety of committees that the initial um, CERT HE document has to go through. So I'm pleased to be able to announce that it's made it through the third committee it, that went through last week, which means that it has been approved in principle and the next stage is validation. Um, validation, I'm, I'm working on the documents for that at the moment, and that requires a, a, pro, a full description of the program, documents for every module that we're offering, and we're, UHI is offering three modules, and OERU is offering the other three that make up the CERT HE business. Um, and we're busy discussing how students will register at the moment, and where we've got to on that is that we think that we will ask students to register per module, so when they're ready for an assessment, they will register on the module, not on the CERT HG. And then when they've collected all six modules, they then register on the CERT HG, which essentially will give them CERT HG because they've already passed all six modules. Um, so validation will, will come up um, in the next couple of months. Um, I've been told that um, that I, I can virtually go ahead now and start working on the modules. So the first one will be the introduction to business, which will be ready in September. And then the other two modules are introduction to customer-centered business and introduction to operations management. Now, these three modules are all modules that we offer at the moment um, in a blended learning format. So there, there is already material um, 
within our VLE, but there's also, it's also delivered on the video conferencing system as well. So there is material that I have yet to capture. Um, the, the one um, big question is assessment. And so there's a, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of questions around assessment at that validation event. But um, the things are on track and uh, I think going pretty well. Oh, oh, Andy, that's wonderful news. Um, and if there's any way uh, we in the network can assist uh, with helping you, in, with, you know, in the documentation around the assessment, I mean, because we do have a robust uh, uh, assessment and credit transfer guidelines that have been approved by the by the network, and uh, I, I don't see that there will be any challenges around how the assessment uh, system works. Just in terms of the language, when Andy's referring to a module that is 200 notional hours or the equivalent of five uh, OERU micro courses, whereas a, a course in North America would typically be three micro courses. And uh, Andy is correct that uh, the OER Foundation is funding the uh, assembly of the remaining 60 credits in the UK system, which is, is half of the CERT, CERT HE, so those business courses will be available for um, uh, assessment. So we'll have the principles of management, we'll have the principles of marketing, we'll have corporate communication, we'll have the introduction to project management, and then also, uh, with Rory's good news today, the microeconomics and the macroeconomics courses. So we, we, may, we may even be able to offer the learners some choice. <laughs> uh, for the, the CERT HE business. So that's wonderful news. Thanks for that, Andy. Uh, Wayne, um, what I will need for validation is the full documentation of each one of those courses. I expect um, the people who are putting those together have similar requirements in their universities. So whatever it is that they produce, which is the official document on what the module is, what the learning outcomes are, what the assessment is, and how it's taught. Um, I'll need that for our validation process. Um, if people could send that to me, that would be great. Thanks. Sure, and, uh, and I'll assist with the coordination of that. Uh, Andy, would you be able to uh, send us through a pro forma uh, in terms of the sort of the structure and how, how you, you know, table these documents? just so that we make sure that we've got all the points covered that you need for the validation process? I can do that, Wayne, but um, I was speaking to our registrar, Rhiannon, and she was saying that uh, she'd be happy to accept whatever the official documentation is um, that, that's being accepted at the other universities that are going to um, accredit this. Okay, oh, that makes it a, a lot easier then. Oh, oh, that, oh that's good news. Yeah, uh, the uh, it, if it doesn't contain everything validation needs, um, I'll get hold of you. But I think let's start with your official documents because I would think that they're going to be similar. Yes, um, and and particularly because uh, how how it would operate within the UHI context would be through a a, a credit transfer protocol. Um, so it's actually transcript credit that would be you know transferred into uh, the cert HE. So yeah. Um, we can take that conversation offline, Andy, and I'll, I'll make sure that we, you know, uh, get the appropriate documentation through to you. Great, and thanks very much. The, uh, the other question, Andy, um, what is your deadline? For, For validation? Yeah. Uh, they haven't created the, um, the date yet. Uh, I would think we've probably got a couple of months uh, but I'll, I can come back to you on that when I'm given a when I'm given a date. Okay. Th thanks, Andy. Thanks. Well, this is really progressing uh, faster than I reasonably anticipated. That's wonderful. Great. All right. Uh, so, in terms of the the courses uh, and the progress, are there any uh, additional comments or questions or you know, from the floor? Uh, David, uh, Rory. Yes, uh, uh, Wade. How um, how is the website coming along? So, I 
student come in and things are all organized in a fashion uh, that he or she can understand. How does that come along with the descriptions for each course and how to get credit for them, et cetera, et cetera? Correct. So, so we have a we have a point uh, on the agenda that speaks to that uh, today, Rory. So we'll be able to update you on on that. So this short answer before, you know, before we go into into detail, that will be ready uh, by MVP launch launch date. Okay. Yep. Uh, David, um, I mean, I'm just singling out the board members. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, terrific. I think that there's a lot of work that's been accomplished and uh, it's really noticeable from the reports uh, just uh, how detailed and robust the outputs are starting to become. That's fantastic. So congratulations, everyone. I think to follow up on Rory's question, getting them established in a single point of presence with a kind of spit and polish that makes them look as if they were planned and organized as a as a set will also be a helpful piece. So I'm totally great to hear that that will also be undertaken. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, thanks Thanks for that, David. I, I have to say we've got an amazing team of folk that are you know, really pulling together and making this happen. It's, it's quite exciting to you know, watch this all fall into place. It really is. Uh, Gail, you had your hand raised. Uh, you just need to unmute yourself, Gail. Okay, sorry. Um, at TRU, we've done a lot of work trying to uh, go to the, fac the faculty with both the art course and the psychology course, discussing the um, assessment and the giving of, awarding of uh, credits at the end. Uh, one thing we've discovered, I'm just going to throw it out there, Although it's possible for me to break, say, uh, research methods and art appreciation into micro courses, the faculty are wanting me to uh, give a final, say for the research methods in psychology, we've come up with a final exam. So even if you work through it in micro units, they don't want to uh, award one credit, like what they have got approved from the EPC, from the, you know, to give yeah. credits, it's for three credits. So after someone's worked through all the micro units, they still are insisting on a comprehensive final exam that if you pass that exam, you're going to get three credits. So yeah. I'm just throwing that out. I'm going to break them up, but I don't know if other universities are like ours that they they don't have a TRU any credits for you know one credit or two credits it just it doesn't exist they only know the whole yep and, and um I, I can confirm uh, gail that is that's fine that's perfectly all right um how the obru model works is our partner institutions retain decision making autonomy uh, regarding how the credits are recognized locally because it's your transcript credit and if you require one exam that's fine. There's no problem whatsoever with that. And that information will be communicated to the learners. Uh, some of the courses here at Otago Polytechnic, for example, we've made considerable progress with micro-credentialing and we will be in a position to be able to recognize credit at, you know, at those smaller chunks and the courses are being designed accordingly. But I mean, that's what's great with, the, with this model is we've got that flexibility for our partner institutions to operate within existing assessment policies. So, it's just fine. Uh, any other questions or, or queries at, at this point? And in uh, standard uh, OER foundation practice or OERU practice, we take silence to mean assent. And silence is a good thing. We are in agreements. We can, we can move forward. Great. So just again, going back to point number three, this is just a reminder that we do have uh, support and communication technologies for those who haven't been using them. We have uh, a, a, a this site at, at chat.overu.org. If you don't have an account, uh, we recommend that you create an account on chat.overu.org. Here at the foundation, both Dave 
uh, and myself, um, you know, do a pretty good job of monitoring this uh, you know, as, as long as we're connected to the net. Um, and a number of the courses have been using this quite extensively. I know Randy, Carol, uh, Ari uh, have been using it. So this, uh, this is a reminder that if you're wanting to get quick feedback or some wiki syntax or uh, anything like that, we do have that available. And of course, we have the main uh, list on groups.oeru.org. Uh, if you're not a member of that list, I strongly recommend that you join that because that's where we post all the communications. So it's just in terms of the communication technologies. Right. Moving on then to number uh, point number five on the agenda. Uh, Adrian Stagg, you made an excellent suggestion on the group list re relating to quality standards and a review checklist. So let me hand the mic over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Wayne. Um, this was just more of um, some of the work that I've been doing recently at USQ uh, around um, just course reviews. Now, we've been working for the last couple of years on several iterations of a uh, what we, we call the, the Learning Environment and Moodle Study Desk. So it's a study desk review form. And at the moment, I believe it's got either 10 or 11 uh, different areas with uh, criteria. We're getting a bit of a feedback loop. Could you please just mute your mic? Sorry, was that to me? Yes, Deborah, if you can just mute your mic, please. We're getting a bit of a feedback echo loop. Oh, sorry. How do I do that? So if you uh, look at the main screen at the bottom of the screen uh, that shows the video, you just, oh, yeah. you just mute. There we go. Thanks. Okay, much better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so yes, we've we've uh, been developing uh, a tool that we use across um, both entire degree programs and also uh, at the individual course level as both a way of, um, well, in two ways. One is uh, if we are designing a new course from the ground up or doing a major rewrite, it provides us with some criteria against which we build. Um, and then also at the end of it, it gives us a way of double checking that what we thought we did uh, has actually been done. And I was discussing with Wayne on the, uh, the open list around the idea that um, maybe developing a similar tool for the OERU um, might be beneficial because we could attach that to each OERU course to show that it has been through a, a, a formal review against consistent criteria um, and it could be altered you know, in any way possible to, to suit the context. Uh, but then also the added bonus is that we've created a tool for open courses, which other organizations would be able to use, build upon, share, uh, repurpose, and, uh, and we can basically harness that power to hopefully uh, refine the document as well. So it was more a question of um, some... Uh, a consistent and transparent way of showing how the courses have been built against some set criteria. Uh, and then Wayne just said to me, well, if I could just reiterate that at this meeting and open it up for discussion. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Adrian. Um, just also by way of update, I, th I think the two relevant points here. The, the first is because partner institutions have retained decision-making autonomy around what they credit and you know, what credit transfer they recognize. Uh, I, I don't think a, a kind of an approval document uh, for, you know, for how the course is transcripted or gets approved locally is, is at our partner institutions that are going to work within the OERU context. Uh, but that said, um, the quality group um, did some initial work looking at the uh, the, the quality standards, which is really about minimum standards of, you know, what an, an OERU course might look like uh, without dictating pedagogy or anything like that. 
uh, which uh, were developed by eCampus Alberta, which are available under an open license. And I think there are aspects in there which would be particularly suited and valuable for the OERU in terms of kind of just sort of minimum requirements as we're doing with MVP, we've defined what the MVP to technology and MVP, you know, sort of pedagogical platform would be, uh, you know, to perhaps think about developing in you know, a review checklist to help the designers, uh, you know, when checking, you know, before the course gets launched that, you know, we've you know, got everything uh, tickety-boo uh, in terms of, you know, like checking the, uh, you know, just by way of example, checking the meter data on all the images in terms of the licensing, you know, those kinds of things. So, I mean, I, I think I think it's a good idea. And at, at, uh, so, so let me open up the floor to discussion to, to get a sense of what uh, folk are thinking and you know, whether we should progress something like this. Can I can I offer one uh, one point of clarification first? Um, I, I completely agree, Wayne, that um, that the the intent around this would not would certainly not be to, to dictate uh, learning and teaching approaches. Um, the, and, and I have looked at the University of Alberta, that, that it's an excellent resource, and I'm actually looking at elements of that that I can draw into USQ2. Um, I suppose that it's more that the indicators are there as, as a way of indicating what good practice would say would be in an online course, how it actually manifests so you've got a principle which people agree upon, but how that principle is actually enacted is not dictated in any way, shape or form. So you've still got the freedom to do whatever it is locally that you do, but it would be more a series of principles that we agreed on that were important to be present in a course. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so um, if, if i reading you correctly, we may... For example, a principle might be that an OERU course would have a course guide that uh, you know presents the course aims uh, and you know what is required for assessment. For example, is, 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 are those the kinds of things you're thinking about? Yeah, that's correct. So um, yeah, there there are clear instructions for students on how to approach the assessment. Now you might decide that that's best done as a text document. There might be an audio file. There it could be it could be a flow chart. It could be anything. How you enact it is up to you. But it's round. You know that there are clear and consistent expectations for students. Those sorts of things. Right, right, right. Yeah, definitely, definitely the sort of stuff you're talking about, Wayne. Yes. So, so let, let me open up the floor there, uh, comments and feedback, uh, particularly folk who have experience in developing and designing courses for OERU. Gail, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I like the idea of the principles and two principles I'd like to throw forward. One around um, accessibility, which comes with universal design. As we put uh, videos, as we put text, trying to keep in mind as a principle that learners may need to access our resources in a variety of ways. So we have to ask ourselves, suppose it's a blind person, suppose it's a deaf person, suppose it's a person who was in an accident and cannot type or, you know, things like that. So that's one we could think about. Uh, some rubrics, some quality matter uh, rubrics I've seen do a good job of asking are the courses you know accessible and some of them not so much they, they focus more on learning outcomes assessments the basics and a second principle which is what my paper is about my colleague and i are submitting a paper called culturally responsive online design and it's looking at and it's missing from most rubrics i've seen even ecampus alberta a little more um sort of deliberate thinking around cultures and the courses being culturally responsive. Like, yes, we can get open images, but are those open images diverse? Because the students taking the courses uh, all over the world or even within Canada, they're very diverse culturally and so on. So my colleague and I are actually um, putting together a kind of checklist, but specifically around are your courses culturally responsive? Mm -hmm. So when it's finished, I will share it with everyone because I think even if you have one of the basic rubrics, it'll be another layer of 
Hmm, let me, some things for your consideration around flexibility, around uh, context, like contextualizing the learning. Because good teaching usually is when you give an example, but sometimes the example you give might only have meaning in one part of the world and totally not appropriate to people at, at, in other places. So it's just something else. I, I, later on, I'll just try and share all the resources I could with everyone for their consideration. Yep. And uh, uh, Andy, um, I, I know that you have uh, expertise in accessibility. Perhaps you'd like to comment. I mean, I, I think the principles of designing for accessibility and uh, designing for diversity are important principles. And it's, you know the kinds of things that we you know we need to be attentive to. Andy, I'm I'm not sure if you wanted to uh, add anything about accessibility. Um, yes, thanks, Wayne. Uh, we have a, a document called the Blended Learning Standards, and in fact, we've just uh, been commended on those by our um, uh, the group that investigates universities. We've just gone through that whole process in the last month or so. And part of that is the accessibility checklist. So it's a basic checklist of um, what you should be doing with each type of document. So what Word documents need, what PowerPoint documents need. And these are all available um, on the internet. So everybody is, is welcome to, um, uh, to download them and use them. Uh, so I'll, uh, Wayne, I'll, well, I'll send everybody the URL now. I'll just have to look it up because it's a horrible thing in Mahara. So it's not an easy URL, but I'll, I'll send you all of that. Thanks, Andy. And if you could just uh, post it on the email list for the group, because um, then we uh, it's uh, a, you know, sort of a permanent record of that, because when we shut down the meeting, the, uh, the chat link will be gone. Um, so right, will do. Th thanks very much, Andy. Uh, Cameron, I believe you had your hand up. Several times, um, because I'm nine. Um, I just wanted to make a point that um, BC eCampus, um, I'm just trying to make sure I've got, or is it Alberta? eCampus Alberta has a model that um, both Otago Polytechnic, um, for those who don't know, I used to live in New Zealand and worked at um, both Otago Polytechnic and Lincoln University over there. Um, and then I was on the steering committee for the um, TANS uh, eCampus's quality assurance stuff that they were doing. So there exists an adapted version of the I'm going to get the name right again. I'm sorry. The eCampus Alberta, um, that's open source and that's floating around. Um, and there's also an Otago Polytechnic version that's a rubric about minimum standards. And there's also a TANS version of it that are all kind of interlinked. And they all touch upon things that, that Gail was talking about um, and Andy um, about accessibility, about um, cultural sensitivity, though obviously in that case it was largely from a, a Maori perspective um, and Pacifica to a limited degree, and also some technical stuff um, around accessibility and just alt tags and even things, simple things like that. Um, and someone from the States could talk to this more than I certainly can, but it's my understanding that a lot of universities fall underneath the heading of government or public and thusly have to follow some of the Americans with disabilities stuff, um, which would mean that it's not a question of warm fuzzy, but a question of mandated. So yeah. that's sort of where I'm at. Yeah. No, th those are good points, Cameron. And uh, I should, uh, I, you know, I can reference it. The guidelines at eCampus Alberta uh, had developed, uh, Tricia Donovan actually, uh, who's the executive director of eCampus Alberta, released it under an open license specifically for the OERU. Uh, and, and we, we used it as an initial starting point to start reviewing that document to see which of those standards would be appropriate and applicable for the OBRU context, because in our context, not everything would be appropriate. For example, we do not provide tutorial support in our courses. Uh, it, it's not a feature that we offer. And so guidelines around minimum standards for tutorial support wouldn't, you know, wouldn't apply in our context. So it would need to be some uh, sort of adaptation, if you will, uh, for yeah. our context. Yeah. I, I think that, that eCampus and, and certainly TANS from the initial stuff that I'd been involved in, their, their main point of difference that they were going to be pushing was uh, student support um, and speed thereof. 
which obviously has a cost associated with it. So there's a, there is a fairly large chunk of it that, that does cover that stuff. But a lot of the other stuff is interesting. Um, it is just that sort of checklist stuff that sometimes you forget to put in, like, yeah. is there an actual course description, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, th thanks for that, Cameron. And, and Randy, uh, you have your hand up? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know exactly where this fits because I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I think that, uh, how can I say, um, ensuring that any materials that are developed within this framework must meet the minimum standard of copyright. Um, and, and it may go without saying, but even in this meeting, there's been a, some question as to what materials are appropriate or not. And, and so I think that's actually extremely important. And I think it also underlines both accessibility of, you know, course content uh, and like output and also the cultural sensitivity point of view, because when these materials are developed openly, they can be reused, remixed, readapted, recontextualized for any language, culture, you know, situation and circumstance. And, and not understanding, um, I mean, I don't think we, the folks would need an in-depth understanding of the licenses, but just, you know, some baseline upon which they can quickly assess whether or not the materials that are, are part of the course can, in a sense, almost break the course because the copyrights are, are, are not appropriate for the, for the, for the actual course. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, uh, uh, Randy, uh, that, that makes uh, perfect sense. And then the issues around uh, remix compatibility, because there's certain license types that you can't remix with other license types. And, and, and so that those copyright requirements would need to be a, you know, a, a minimum standard, so to speak. Look, um, in, in the spirit of the OERU model, we work on a, a rough consensus and running code decision-making approach. Uh, so let me reflect. I, I mean, I think there's a rough consensus emerging that uh, it would be good to uh, start working on the development or, adapt or adaptation of these guidelines. So, you know, we take an existing set of guidelines that are available under an open license and we adapt and, uh, ref uh, and, and remix them in, in ways that are appropriate for the OERU delivery model uh, as an open project within the wiki, uh, which will progress as we move forward, is what I'm hearing as a kind of a rough consensus emerging from the group. So let me put it out there that we constitute a, a, a working group um, within the OERU that starts looking at developing you know, these review checklists and guidelines based on a remix of existing open materials. Uh, as, as a decision for moving forward. Um, so let me put that out there. If there are any substantive objections to the gist of that decision, um, please speak now. Uh, if not, we'll take silence to mean assent. Um, Adrian, uh, does that make sense to you? Yes, certainly does make sense. Um, and I just threw in the text there that I, I do agree with the with the motion. Thanks very much. And uh, so the follow-up question is, uh, Adrian, would you, would you be keen on uh, taking a lead on that, uh, into sort of the lead facilitator and helping us move forward? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, I'm, I, one of the things that I have actually um, task, been tasked with this year, uh, Dr. Sarah Hammer, who produced the, uh, the study S review list that we use at USQ, um, and I were going to be working in the second half of the year to just do a review of a lot of the other frameworks and, and standards lists that were out there in order to strengthen the USQ version. And so I see that these are actually parallel tasks. Um, and we release the first review under a CC by license anyway. So we'll continue to release these openly. And, uh, and again, if I, can, if I can get input from this group uh, and get people's um, um, uh, viewpoints and, and leverage people's experience and expertise within this group, then I can only see benefits there. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, um, sounds like we've, we have a plan. Right. Moving on then, I just want to acknowledge uh, Deborah Mason, who's joined us. Uh, I think you joined us uh, just shortly after the introductions, uh, Deborah. So if you don't mind, uh, and I also reported back on behalf of the, uh, the History in the Modern Era course, but uh, perhaps if you just introduce yourself and you can just give us a feel of where you're at on, on, on the project development. And my apologies for not not noticing your arrival. Uh, uh, and I'm just trying to watch too many windows at once, so uh, Deborah. <laughs> Not at all. I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you, Wayne, and, and my apologies in turn. I'm actually going to have to leave the meeting shortly due to another uh, meeting. I only found out about this meeting yesterday. But um, hello, everyone. I've recently been contracted to do world history in the modern era and, and very excited to be part of the team. I've done three OEIU courses before um, directly for the University of Wollongong. Um, but now I've, I've come to join the um, OEIU Foundation's project to create the first year of courses directly um, and thrilled to be, to be part of it um, and happy to, to work with you all. Well, thanks very much, Deborah, and, and welcome to the family on the OER Foundation. Thank you. Great to have you on. Mm -hmm. Wayne, it's, it's Rory. Uh, um, yes, go, go ahead, Rory. I'd, I'd suggest, too, that even, I mean, right from the release of when we, when we release, that we have a format that can be easily downloaded. The whole course can be easily downloaded for institutions or others, individuals who, are, who have to work offline or, or whatever. And we could simply have a, you know, do you want to download and have a zip file or something? Is, is that doable? Um, so, so the, the short answer to that question is uh, yes, that is doable. We have made some provisional progress uh, in that space, in that direction. We, there will still need to be some code uh, development uh, on our end. But just to give you a, a feel and a sense of how that might work is we have a script which takes a collection of wiki pages that publishes to the WordPress site, which is actually used as a sort of a delivery site for online. But if you do request a, a, a snapshot with the script, we have done some provisional work to create what we would call a, a static snapshot. So that would be a zip file of a, a website which you could view offline. So it, it, the short answer is yes, it's technically possible. Uh, the thing is we need some help on the technical side uh, and you're just getting a bit more capacity on board to help with the development. So I might just uh, hand over to Dave now. You can uh, speak to those possibilities, Dave, in being able to sort of export a package zip file of you know, the collection of pages. And then we will uh, also take the updates on the MVP technology platform. Yes, hi there. Um, at this stage, uh, I am still coming to terms with or coming to grips with all of the functionality of the ability to export um, content from the wiki. Um, so I will have to uh, I will have to investigate that particular um, requirement. I'm afraid. Um, so yes, we with the departure of Jim Titzler from the team, we have uh, lost a fair bit of uh, historical knowledge on the um, very clever functionality that he's put it together for his website. But I'm confident that uh, his um, capabilities will be um, something I can pick up. Uh, uh, the, the ability to tweak and to um, modify the way that. Uh, that we export content from the wiki, I think, is something that, um, that we'll be able to promote or, or build on very, um, very rapidly. Um, would you like, Wayne? Would you like me to, to? I'll just give an update on the uh, the functionality in the single sign-on. I mean, yes, that that would be good, uh, Dave. If but also Rory, if you can just mute your microphone again, we're getting a little bit of an echo coming through. Uh, but the short answer is, Rory, yes, it would be technically possible. Uh, we'll just have to look at the capacity in terms of getting it done. I mean, there are other things that we could potentially look at uh, using some clever solutions for single-page applications for mobile phones. 
uh, and so that people could uh, download or install OERU courses on their mobile phones without having internet connectivity. And, and you know, those kinds of things would be technically possible. And, and working with an open source product, um, these are things that we could code. Uh, but it's really a question of you know getting the development capacity to do that coding. Um, you know the OER Foundation has the sum total of two FTE staffs. So <laughs> uh, but we we're, we're optimistic uh, when we get that big grant coming in, uh, we'll be able to expand the the development team. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly there are certainly lots of of well worn paths for achieving those kinds of things. So it's not it's it wouldn't be a whole lot of of breaking new ground in order to provide those kinds of capabilities in uh, to, to, to my mind those are just different modes of delivery which are relatively straightforward to achieve um, so yeah it, it, as, as Wayne says it's just a question of, of capacity and prioritizing the different mechanisms that we want to, to achieve uh, for the NDP um, just to give you a quick update on the other technology uh, the other technological challenges that we're trying to complete now. Um, I've been spending a fair bit of time digging deep into the process of single sign-on systems. Um, some of your institutions are probably uh, wrestling with a very similar problem for all of the services that you provide, uh, and it is not a uh, straightforward problem, uh, as it turns out. However, we are now having some, some initial success in uh, allowing a single source of, of credentials to be used a, alongside a number of our um, of, of the OERU services. So as you can see from the image that Wayne has, uh, has put up, um, effectively what we have now is a test system which allows someone, potentially a learner or someone collaborating on building materials uh, learning materials to log into a single system which they then can control uh, for example their account details like their their email address or their password but having logged into that single system they are then able to access using with with that same set of credentials uh, other services that the OERU offers um, at the moment the uh, course resource bank is the is the test um, service that we are using and we are now uh, able to allow people to sign in to the central system, the directory as we call it, um, and transparently when they go to the resource bank website, they will already be logged in uh, and their credentials will be passed through to the resource bank and now I'm uh, on working on the process of slowly uh, propagating that same capability to some of our other services. So the, the main focus at this stage will be the, uh, the WordPress sites, but we will also be looking at um, doing something similar with our community and forum sites, our chat service, and, and of course, Wiki Educator itself. Um, so we also have a few challenges uh, emerging out of that, which is the fact that many of you already have credentials uh, on some of those other systems, and we will have to somehow uh, consolidate all of those into a single sign-on service. So we'll have to, this is a, a, an evolving thing, but I'm, I'm confident that based on the progress we've made that we'll have this ready for the uh, MVP. Yeah. Just so thanks. Uh, thanks for that, David. So just in short, uh, sort of the layman's perspective is no OERU learner would be required to have a password in order to access any course materials. Um, that's a key philosophy of the OERU because if you have to have a password in order to see the materials, uh, that can't be de defined as being open. However, if a learner does want to participate in uh, services we host, like forums and the chat and the resource bank and those other services, the aim is for the learners to have one credential that they would use for OERU that would authenticate them across all our distributed services. So that's that's the aim. Uh, but I, I, I must also add, this is uh, a, a particularly tricky area at the technology level. It's, it, it's quite complex and there's a lot of heavy lifting that happens behind the scenes in, in terms of getting this right. 
I, you know, I came back from a visit to one of our partner institutions in Australia a couple of weeks ago, and I was told that they're spending $8 million on a single uh, sign-on solution, and uh, we don't have $8 million. <laughs> so. you, ha you have Dave. <laughs> <laughs> So I just wanted to say, um, just to, to uh, underline what you're saying, Wayne, that, that the idea behind the authentication that this sign-on system provides is not so much um, blocking access or, or enabling access to services, but it's rather uh, enabling consistent identity um, across the system so that if someone, for example, posts on a forum, that the identity that they use to post on a forum is, a, is consistent with the one that they use, for example, to store their own information in a resource bank. It's more about a user having um, the ability to have a consistent um, mapping of, of their information to services that we offer for their benefit, as opposed to a mechanism for providing a gatekeeper role on our, from our perspective. Yeah. So just want to clarify that. And that's a very important distinction, uh, you know, aligned with our, our, our values. Yep. So, uh, let okay. me, uh, any questions or uh, thoughts from the floor in relation to the single sign-on? If not, uh, we will move on to the next item of the agenda. Uh, actually, just wanted to mention one thing, Wayne, also. Um, to the extent that we are able to get all of these uh, services working, um, and, and of course, that, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm confident we will be able to do so. <laughs> it's conceivable that some of our, our, our tertiary partners um, will be able to uh, take the documentation that we provide for how the system is put together to actually advance their own um, efforts towards single sign-on. So it, it's conceivable that they can uh, save some of their $8 million and instead, for example, put it into building open educational resources. Exactly, and a, a, a huge benefit of membership of the foundation here. Yeah, very good point. Thanks, Dave. Um, now, did you want to go into some of the other questions regarding things like the website? And uh, I can speak yeah, that'll, about that. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, so um, we are currently uh, reviewing the way that the OERU website works and the degree to which it's possible for us to, for example, keep up to date the, um, in the directory of potential courses and so on, uh, as well as the um, information related to our different partner institutions. Um, at the moment, the system that, uh, that we have um, is starting to reach the end of its, uh, I think, the end of its life. It's becoming a little bit difficult to, to maintain. Uh, and so we are looking at the possibility of, uh, prior to the MVP, creating a uh, replacement for that um, OERU website, which will uh, meet the requirements, the emerging requirements that we have for um, allowing users to get a clear access to a directory of um, a directory of available courses and credentials and the partner institutions with whom they can uh, can seek to gain assessment and so on. Um, and so, yes, that is that is going to be one of our areas of concentration in the coming weeks. Yeah. So, so thanks for that, Dave. And, and, and Rory, this uh, begins to speak to your question you had earlier. Uh, there are two activities in the wiki at the moment. One which is the review of the current website. So if anyone has any suggestions for improvement of the current website, that we, we document those. And we're in the process of developing the specifications for you know, how we communicate uh, these courses to learners, the pathways they will have to different exit credentials, what assessment options are available, which partners will be offering those assessment of, uh, options, and which courses are recognized for credit transfer across the network. Um, and so we're in the process of designing and developing that. It's more than likely that we will, will host this using the Drupal engine, Dave. Um, but uh, I, I, I guess, you know, we, we will still take a decision on that. We're currently using Silver Stripe. Uh, the history of the, OER, the current OERU website is, you know, that was put together uh, very, very quickly uh, for the soft launch at Thompson Rivers. Um, and, and while you know we, we do have course listings, um, 
the way in which these courses are navigated aren't of very much help to a learner trying to get an exit credential. Uh, and, and we really need to improve that interface. And uh, with an improved system, we could start thinking uh, of you know, dashboard functionality that a learner, for example, could have a listing of all the courses that they're engaged in and you know, the courses that they might have an interest in taking uh, in the future. So, uh, Rory, we, we, we are planning to uh, you know, implement those improvements to the main OERU website. Uh, when uh, I guess the reason I, or one of the reasons I put that we need we need to have a quick download is that I'm, I'm thinking of many many students in developing countries who can go. They may have a mobile device, as you refer to, a tablet, a, ta a tablet, and uh, they go. They want to take the course. And they want to work at night. At internet connectivity that they can just simply download it. Uh, it had saved them an awful lot of, of uh, bother. And uh, I don't know where it is in the priority list. And I can understand maybe the first iteration you can't have that. But, uh, to me, I think that that is really, uh, uh, that would really expand the use of our, uh, of our uh, universities. Um, just I can respond briefly to that just to say that um, there are potentially some fairly substantial technological challenges in achieving both aims at the same time. Um, I have quite a bit of uh, background in doing things like allowing people to uh, take online content and convert it with the click of a button automatically into a PDF. And I can tell you just that, that there are some substantial um, challenges with regard to things like consistent layout and the ability to consolidate something that would have been a lot of different pages on a, on a website into a single document and things like that. So um, while I think it is probably a good direction, or it's, it's something for us to certainly uh, be thinking about and, and to do it if it is possible, I also think one of the key, uh, one of the key things that we need to recognize is that um, access to the internet is becoming more and more pervasive very, very, very rapidly, uh, especially in the developing world. And I think what we need to do is, is avoid focusing too much um, resource on trying to suit what is increasingly a smaller and smaller group of people who have not got access or, or reasonable access to the internet. Yeah. I think we might want to focus more on this, on the things that allow us to um, propagate this to those who do have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, and, and, and that's good advice, uh, you know, uh, Dave, that we don't, you know, over or, or go down the pathway, which is serving a very, sort of narrow technological audience. Uh, but we can, we can work incrementally, for example, so by saying, okay, let's, let's adopt you know, HTML5 or whatever it is as our sort of interoperability standard and package things that could be displayed locally in the browser, uh, which wouldn't need much conversion. And, and so the work that we're doing and focusing on mobile responsive design uh, can be a significant incremental step in providing offline versions. Uh, that you know can be uh, provided to learners who have very expensive or unreliable connectivity. So there might be community centers where you know you just uh, with your SD card you know put it on your phone or whatever. So I mean it's it's a it's a priority, Rory, uh, but it's 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 not a cheap solution. Let me put it that way. Um, but it's a kind it's a it's an area where the foundation conceivably. Uh, could be bidding to you know some of the big donors you know just to get a bit of ex extra capacity on board, and or uh, developers at our various partner institutions who work in the open source field should possibly you know donate a little bit of time in in, in helping us move that agenda forward. Um, there is some knowledge. Um, and I don't remember if it's still up the proceedings for it. There was some stuff about like local installs of various different LMSs for 
for areas that had issues with that. I know that there was a problem with that with um, Lincoln part Lincoln University partners with um, language like beginner language students. Um, I can't remember the proper term for that. Anyways, they they have people coming in from PNG and they were having issues out of uh, with contact outside of Port Moresby. And then there was also some people in Wellington who are now Kino Pacific doing work where they were shipping. Um, complete installs of Moodle on disks and um, then you could load your content locally because they were having some of those issues. But I agree with you, Wayne, that sticking it on a on an SD card that they can just be read by any browser might actually wind up working because then you aren't doubling up your um, your CSS. You're just reusing the one that you might have written for your uh, your mobile devices. Yeah. And, and, and the other big advantage we have, we've been smart in uh, the the pedagogy, if you will, that we've been adopting on these courses. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a pedagogical or technological approach that could support low bandwidth connectivity. So in other words, we've designed the courses in ways that would not require high bandwidth for offline viewing, if, if you see what I'm saying. So the only uh, bandwidth requirement would be a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, or a, a micro blog post or something should uh, folk have uh, connectivity. So um, the bits and pieces of the puzzle are coming together well. It's you know a question of getting the capacity on board to, you know to implement. Yep. Just just to, just to point out um, the the snapshotting functionality that uh, that Jim Titzler has developed um, already is extracting uh, the content from our from our wiki formatted um, learning materials and. Um, the, the mechanism that's being used to put it into Word, WordPress sites is effectively the same as the mechanism that could be used to put it into a static HTML form, or it's very similar. So it would not be outrageous to suggest that we could create kind of a uh, an archive of, of, of courses, which would of course be a snapshot. Um, they wouldn't obviously be updated um, Any times one of the authors of the materials made a change. However, we could do those snapshots periodically and make those available for people to download if they only had sporadic internet access so that they could then peruse those that content without having an internet connection. Yeah. But of course, any of the interactive components of that would be affected. Um, and that's unfortunately inevitable. Yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, Posting a uh, a flash a flash disk uh, is broadband with connectivity in, in some respects. So um, you know that's where communities can start getting involved. Is you know taking these snaps and just mailing them out to remote areas. So it, you know it's certainly conceivable, and we have the sort of the techno uh, technology back in to make progress in this space. Yeah. Right. In, 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 Questions relating to the website redesign project, and of course, you're all invited to please uh, pr provide feedback on the review of the current website. So, uh, we, we, we've got your needs and wish lists oh. there when we, we start developing the new, the new version. Hi, um, uh, Randy here. I have just a couple of comments, if I can, about this uh, conversation you guys are having. Sure. Okay. Um, I think. You know, okay, I've got two comments. Um, I, you know, when Dave was mentioning that, um, uh, that the project is somehow more geared to the people that have internet access because that amount of people is growing, I got the heebie-jeebies. I felt actually very uncomfortable um, because there is a wide swath of people still who don't have internet connectivity or access, and certainly not to the same degree that we would have here. And even here, we have trouble, you know, connecting with people who are in Philadelphia. So, um, so I, I, I just want to raise that. And I, I, I see this, or I hear this conversation at a technical level, but I think that there. Um, the, the sort of the themes that are being discussed here have great import to the marketing activities. Okay, and some of the key messages that you're, you're going to use in the future. Um, um, 
I think that, you know, from the experiences that, say, I had with colleagues at the Commonwealth of Learning, um, uh, there was this idea of providing enabling technology and then dropping it into communities that could leverage their resources, their skills, their, their abilities, their networks, infrastructure, their relationships, and really foster a stronger sense of community. And I think that that's really important here uh, because it might take a long time before you get the resources, the, you know, the uh, financial resources to reach the goal that's, you know, identified here. Um, and that, you know, maybe in the next generation of technology, uh, it, it might yield uh, the, 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 this capability. And I, you know, so anyways, there's a community, you know, when you know me that I'm really all about community, I, I, I think that's really important. So I think it's important to recognize not just the technical challenges, but the, the ability of the communities to leverage the existing technology to achieve their particular goals, whether they have internet connectivity or not. That's number one statement. The second question or comment that I have is with regarding with regard to the current sort of download snapshot technology, will there be a way to and it to kind of monitor whom who does it, who is doing it, and where the content is being downloaded? I'm not talking about to a mobile phone or a device, but I'm talking more about the context in which they're operating because that can uh, yield an additional opportunity for the OERU. Like if we know who's doing it, we can reach out to them and see where there are opportunities for further collaboration, what the local needs are. Like, it, again, it's, it's kind of like a community building thing, but, but um, um, you know, sustainability, you know, is when people actually use what we've created, right? So yep. those are my two yep. comments. Yeah, and and uh, and thanks for that, Randy. And um, I, you know, here at the OER Foundation, we also nodding our heads. Uh, our prime reason for existence is to widen access to more affordable education opportunities, particularly for those learners who are excluded. So, and um, that is first and foremost in our minds. Uh, it's the whole reason we exist. Uh, and but um, as, as you point out, they, they, you know, we, we have to do it incrementally, uh, you know, one step at a time. Um, and, and part of the purpose of uh, working with a minimum viable product is to have the basic product to get out there, uh, so that that enables us to take the next step uh, on, on this journey. So um, we we in total agreement uh, on the analytics side. I'm, I am also conscious of the the, the time. Uh, of the meeting, so I'll, I'll quickly run through the the last uh, two items of the agenda, which speaks to some of the questions you've uh, you've raised, Randy. Uh, we do have a uh, a marketing uh, a marketing communications and fund development project. We were fortunate enough to get a, a a small capacity development grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and um, we have uh, professional marketers who are assisting. At the OERU in improving components of our marketing. Uh, what I wanted to reference is uh, the second phase of this marketing project relates to the whole uh, student recruitment side of things. So we will be spending uh, some of, the, of, of this money on marketing uh, the OERU opportunities uh, to learners so that you know, the learners who are, are excluded uh, from the opportunities of education get to know about us, right? Uh, and, and some of the work that has been done there is, you know, de developing a, a, a student video, uh, which will help with the marketing, the print collateral that goes with that, because maybe people in the developing world will, 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 will not be able to afford the high bandwidth with the video access. So there will be some uh, work done on the marketing uh, collateral uh, we are also going to be on the partner recruitment side working with uh, an open source product called uh, Mautic, uh, 
uh, which is, you know, an, is an open source marketing automation uh, software which helps with uh, lead development or lead identification and following leads and, and, and this sort of thing. And we'll be using the work we're doing with the partners with this open source technology to see how we can uh, improve getting the word out to uh, prospective learners in different audiences. Uh, speaking to Randy's point about uh, tracking, uh, you know, what, what learners uh, are doing. Uh, again, we, we are restricted by the capacity we have, but we were also very fortunate in uh, getting an offer from uh, the Hewlett Foundation to utilize some of the capacity of a, a, a company called Lunar Metrics. Uh, they are a, an analytics company that focus on uh, you know analytics, and uh, there's some uh, capacity available with the contract that Lunar Metrics has with the Hewlett Foundation, and Hewlett offered to uh, a number of grantees the opportunity to make use of uh, this analytics expertise. And I'm pleased to report uh, that Hewlett has approved that Lunar Metrics can uh, uh, assist us with some analytics work on the courses uh, that we will have available for minimum viable product. Of course, Randy, there are unique challenges uh, because if we don't require user registration for a registered session, that limits the kinds of you know, analytics one can collect. But by the same token, there are all the ethical issues around you know, what data we collect as an open organization and how we use it. So um, you know, those are all the issues we are going to need to unpack as we're moving forward. But at least we will be able to implement some rudimentary uh, learning analytics uh, for the MVP. Uh, we also have an open questionnaire, very similar to what we did with the early days with Wiki Educator. Uh, an optional questionnaire, every new uh, OERU learner would be able to provide some feedback for us to, you know, help us improve as, as, as we move forward. So, you know, in small little steps, one step at a time, we, we're, we're starting to, to, you know, to tackle those, those, those issues. So that was just by way of updating. There will be uh, some uh, work done on the marketing side of things and a little work uh, to be done on analytics. And at, at that point, um, uh, and, and if there's any feedback and comment, we're happy to take feedback and comment. I am available, but I am conscious that we have, uh, we've had a long meeting, but it's been a very productive meeting. Uh, and you know, there's outstanding progress that's been made. This is good. Uh, silence means assent, or it means folk are tired, and that's <laughs> and that's fine. Okay. All right, colleagues. Uh, for those of you that are still with us, I really appreciate your generous gift of time uh, to join us for for this meeting, and uh, we are on track to achieving MVP. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne, and everyone else. Goodbye, all. Bye, everyone. Good night or day. <laughs> Definitely yeah. night, yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Evening, yeah. All right. Good night, all. Bye.